Donald Goins, Horse Son, Chapter 19. My return to the free world was uneventful. No one really cared whether I came home or not. Big Mama was dead, and I didn't have anything in common with Tony since he plucked off my woman. In fact, I made it a point to stay out of their way. I didn't know how I would react if I ran up on boots, so I kept my distance. The streets hadn't changed that much. There was a new group of young pimps hanging around on the corners, but besides that, it seemed as if the clock had stood still. My first stop had been at the bank where the lawyer had deposited my money. I withdrew it and made a beeline for the nearest Cadillac dealer. I put $4,000 on a new caddy with the promise to bring the other 2800 on the date of delivery. Since I didn't have any credit, I had to pay cash, but it didn't make any difference. When I left prison, I had close to $3,000 in my account, and with the five grand Big Mama left me, I still had enough to get a few rags to wear. Tony had my jewelry, and I was on my way to get my diamonds from him without any static. I spoke to the car dealer. How about letting me use one of those old junks till my car is delivered? He shook his head. I don't think I could do that. If you had an accident or something, we'd be in one hell of a fix here. I pulled out my bankroll and peeled off a $50 bill. You think that will cover your problem until my car is delivered? He pocketed the bill and called one of the colored men working on the lot and had him put up a dealer's plate on one of the older cars. I drove off the lot and headed downtown. After getting my license straightened out, I stopped at a clothing store and bought a few outfits. Dusk was just falling when I turned onto Hastings. Tony had moved all of his girls down to the lower end of the street because of the misunderstanding with Big Mama. And after her death, he was too settled where he was to move back to the neighborhood we had been raised in. Since I didn't know where he lived, I pulled up in front of six girls working in the doorway to inquire to where his whereabouts were. Five of them rushed up to the car. They all were short skirts and their faces were heavily painted. Hi, honey, the leader of the group yelled. Which one of us do you want to see? The leader was a large woman with an abundance of everything. You could look at her and see that she must have been cute before she allowed herself to gain so much weight. Now that she was going too fat, it was hard to discover anything attractive about her. But when she smiled, showing the tip of her tongue at the corner of her mouth, there was the promise of sweet sensuality and exorbitant delight. There hadn't been the slightest thought in my mind of playing stuff, but since she had hit on me, I decided to teach her a lesson. Yeah, baby, why don't you sit down for a minute? Maybe you and me can reach some kind of agreement. She tossed a wicked look over her shoulder at her friends as though to tell them she had just pulled off a grand coup. Her attitude was one of authority. You could tell she was under the impression that she was the leader of the hen house. I drove around the corner and parked. What's your name, honey? I asked softly. Most of my dates just call me Ruby, sweetie. Appearances could really be deceiving. This bitch actually thought I was a mark. I want to talk to you for a few moments, Ruby. I said while I pulled my huge bankroll out. I scanned through the money for a second, then found a $10 bill and put it in her lap. Her eyes got big as a dinner plate at the side of my bankroll. Sure, sweetie, as long as you got the price, I got the time. She capped, trying to control the greed in her voice. Assuming an air of embarrassment, I put the little game into action. Ruby, I don't know how to ask you this, but uh, I, uh, I want you to teach me how to pimp. That really caught the bitch unprepared. 
She stared at me with her eyes wide and her mouth flopping like a caught fish. I continued before she had time to speak. What I mean is, I'll pay you to show me how to dress like a pimp, act like one, and really carry myself like one. I rushed on. You ain't got to worry about getting paid, because my daddy died and left me $25,000. I'm going to buy me a Cadillac as soon as I get the rest of the money. I pulled the bankroll back out. As you can see, I got $5,000 of it now. I flashed six $100 bills at her. Beyond a doubt, the bitch was hooked. She just stared at me dumbfounded. You don't think you'll have any difficulty teaching me what I want to know, do you, Ruby? She shook her head. Ain't no trouble in teaching you, but I mean, you ain't bullshitting about this, are you? This ain't some kind of joke you call yourself having on me, is it? Is that money in your lap a joke? I asked. Again, she shook her head. You mean you don't want to go to no hotel or nothing like that? Absolutely not, young lady. Pimps don't go to bed with a woman the first time they meet her, do they? For a minute, I began to think I was laying it on her a little too thick. She stared at me as though I was losing my goddamn mind. That's right, honey. You don't want to go to bed with me if you want to be a pimp. They don't hop in and out of bed with every woman they meet the way a square would do. It hadn't taken her long to catch on to the way the trend was going. She rumbled around in her pocketbook and came out with a pencil and small notebook. She had come to the conclusion that I was some kind of nut and decided to play on me for the $10 bill I had given her. I didn't want her to give me the wrong number, so I aroused her greed. Pitting off a $5 bill, I put it in her lap. You make sure I can get in touch with you now, Ruby, because I want you to help me pick out my Cadillac and clothes. Plus, I'm going to pay you real well when I get the rest of my money sometime this month. The thought of playing me out of that money had become so exciting to her, she could hardly breathe. When she tried to speak, her words came out in blurts. Her features lacked any compassion. To her, I was the once-in-a-lifetime trick. I stared at her in amusement. The big, out-of-shape, cow-like bitch really believed she would end up beating me out of some money. After I took the address she had written out, she staggered away from the car as though she was drunk. At no time during our conversation had she even asked for my name. I pulled away from the curb full of confidence. This was one bitch that was getting ready to get faked completely out of her whore boots. Now my immediate problem was to find Tony so I can get my diamonds. I drove slowly back up Hastings examining various faces in the late model cars I passed. The neighborhood hadn't changed much unless it was even more decrepit than before I left. For the first time in my life, I didn't feel as if I was coming home. I could look at the sores of poverty and truly understand the meaning of slum life. The filthy streets, the wine heads sitting in doorways, the horrible shacks some unfortunate souls called home. I realized that there had to be something better in life for me. On the opposite corner, I saw a blood-red Cadillac parked at the curb. I pulled over and found a parking place. I had got the wire in prison that Tony owned a red caddy, and I didn't think there were too many red Cadillacs on this side of town. I stopped in two restaurants first, without any luck, then crossed the street and entered Ed's bar. Just about the first thing I saw was Tony sitting at a table with two white girls. He saw me and waved a hand in my direction. I walked slowly over to his table. Oh, son, I heard you was out, baby. How come you didn't look me up so I can give you a coming home party? The people in the bar had become silent as students in a deaf and dumb school. I stared around at some of the familiar faces. Horace sat on bar stools staring at us curiously. 
while behind the bar, the white owner watched us closely for trouble. The cracked bar mirror revealed alcohol-flushed faces waiting in anticipation. I stared coldly at Tony. The only thing I want you to give me, nigga, is what you got that belongs to me. For a moment, he didn't quite understand what I was talking about. He stared around undecided for a second, then his face brightened. Oh, yeah, you mean your jewelry, don't you? His voice has taken on a chilling note. His two girls stared at us with frightened eyes. There was no doubt about it. If I pushed it, Tony wouldn't back up an inch. He would meet me on any terms I wanted. I knew in my heart that all I had to do was pull up a chair and we would resume our friendship as though nothing had happened. I wanted to, for a fact, but something inside me would allow me to bend and grasp the outstretched hand of friendship again. Again, he tried to bridge the gap between us. Removing my watch from his arm, he spoke quietly. Dig, whore son. Ain't no whore in the world worth the friendship between two men. He slid the watch across the table towards me. If you think I'm bullshitting, dig this. I've had these two whores with me for the last two days looking for you. These are the best whores in my stable. Whore son, and you can have either one of them you want. She's yours, man. I'll send her clothes over to your joint if you'll just say the word. Plus, you can take her on with you. Both women stared to complain, but he silenced them immediately. He removed my ring and shoved it across the table at me. I stared at the women. One was a blonde while the other had dyed her hair bright red. Both were still in their early 20s. From his point of view, he probably thought he was offering me a damn good substitute for boots. But when I looked at the two pale-faced white girls, I knew that neither one of them could ever take the place of black queen he had taken from me. I shook my head, rejecting the offer. Even if he had offered boots, I would have turned it down. What goes around comes around, Tony. I said, slipping my ring on. I just hope you can recognize game when it comes your way. He sighed deep and slowly. My open refusal of his offer had hurt him. One of his white girls, the blonde, had been watching me closely. She gave me the impression that if I had chosen her, she wouldn't have objected to the trade. I turned on my heel and walked away. I hadn't had a woman since I'd been home and it had been well over six years since I slept with one, so I didn't want my weakness to show. The women he had offered were very beautiful, not tramps. It wasn't hard to believe him when he said they were the best of his stable. My conscience was starting to act up. Should I have accepted his offer or renewing our friendship? I couldn't see where it benefited me to ruin our relationship, but my pride had been hurt. I meant to repay Tony for what he had done, whether I was right or wrong. Some way, somehow, the day would come when he would experience payback. As I crossed the street, I could hear the sound of high heel shoes running behind me. When I got to the car door, she caught up with me. I looked over my shoulder at the fine blonde. She smiled up at me. She was small with large legs. Her skin was smooth, milky white, with no blemishes. Hi, honey. I hope you didn't mind me following you. It was my idea, not Tony's. I didn't appreciate the way you rejected me in the damn bar, so I asked Tony if it would be all right if I came out here with you. That's all you wanted to do? I asked coldly. Is come out here in the street and watch me drive away? Her laughter rang out merrily. She was the first woman I had heard laugh in quite a while. The sound was more pleasing than I could have anticipated. After a man has been locked up for a long time, he will appreciate the small things a woman does, things that he probably wouldn't have noticed before. You know, horse son, I want to do a little more than just watch you drive away, but it's your decision. 
It was too much temptation. She was too attractive for me to just walk away from. I held the car door open. She climbed in from the driver's side. Her skirt rose up above her thighs as she slid across the seat. Words would fail me if I tried to explain how I gaped at those pretty big thighs. How can I describe how a man feels after being away from something so long? To have it laid out on a platter for him. My first stop after pulling away from the curb was the drugstore. After purchasing a fifth of whiskey, my next stop was the motel I had been staying at. We undressed slowly, sipping on the whiskey and smoking up the reefer I had stashed around the room. Whether or not it was alcohol, I don't know. But as we drank, I began to turn mean. She had told me her name was Ann, but the more I drank, the more I began to call her Jerry. At the beginning, I hadn't meant to abuse her. Each drink I took convinced me that it was my right to dog her. After we had had relations, a brutal idea began to grow in my mind. She lay there beside me nude on her stomach. I rolled over on top of her and she started to squirm. Not so soon, horse son. Damn, you'll wear me out at this pace. Shut up, bitch, I said. I'm getting ready to teach you something new. Uh Uh-uh, she said. Ain't nothing new about doing it like that, and it hurts besides. She began to try and squirm from under me, but I had all my weight on top of her. And as she was still on her stomach, using my feet, I put them between her legs and began to spread them open. Hastily, I fumbled around until I got the spot I wanted. With my finger as a guide, I pushed deeply into her rectum. Her scream shattered the stillness of the room, but it didn't interfere with the act of violence I was committing on her body. Taking a towel from off the backboard of the bed, I wrapped it around her head, covering her mouth, then continued to force my desire on her helpless body. She cried and moaned but the towel muffled her attempts to call for help. With each succeeding lawless act I forced on her, I moved that much closer to the edge of madness. For the next three days, I kept her with me, not allowing her out of my sight. The only place she went was the toilet, then back to the bed. When we got hungry, I called out and had food delivered. Whenever someone knocked on the door, I made her go into the shower and turn the water on. At times when I was raping her, I could hardly recognize my own voice, cursing and muttering incoherently. On a rare occasion, I would commit a normal act of intercourse with her, but my preference was for the abnormal. When the morning came that I grew tired of her, or rather returned to sanity, She was a poor specimen of the opposite sex. Her face was tear-stained from constant crying, while her body was a mass of blue bruises. Discoloration had set in around her nipples from my treatment. When she realized that I was really going to let her go, she jumped into her clothes. She waited until she was standing in the open doorway before speaking. You dirty son of a bitch, she snarled. You ain't no man. You're an animal and a dog at that. You bastard, you. There was nothing attractive about her face now. Fatigue and hate had distorted her features into a mask of hatred. Without makeup, there was nothing left of the cute blonde I had entered the motel with. Her face was a blueprint of hell. My booming laughter beat at her in the empty doorway. When you see your man, bitch, tell him my only regret is that it was you I fucked in the ass instead of him. Tell him not to worry, though, because he's got his coming. Before she could slam the door, I added, don't go away mad, bitch, just go away. She slammed the door so hard I thought for a moment the glass would break. After that, the room became silent as a tomb. I found my wallet and pulled out Ruby's phone number. It was another smart bitch that had one hell of a sunrise coming her way.